Fauci says, get out there and trick or treat to your heart's content this Halloween. What the heck happened with Friday's dismal jobs report? And not even James Bond can save the domestic box office. Monday Need to Know. Let's go. Good morning, gang. This is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for October 11th. As you can hear, I'm Carlo Versano, and it's going to be a solo pod today. Jill and Baker are both off. I am the only chump uh, working on this holiday, it appears. But in all seriousness, happy Columbus Day or Indigenous Peoples Day, whichever you prefer, I suppose. The irony, of course, is that uh, this should probably really be called Leif Erikson Day, as he was the guy who actually discovered the Americas like 500 years before Columbus even landed in what is now known as San Salvador. Columbus, by the way, he never even stepped foot on the continental United States. But anyway, this has become somewhat of a controversial holiday lately as Americans have kind of come to terms with the fact that this country did some pretty bad stuff in our early days uh, and not just to black people. There were a lot of folks who were already here when we showed up before they were systematically relocated and exterminated in the interest of populating America with white Europeans. But in all seriousness, the United States did perpetrate terrible violence against those people and uh, their culture and history deserve celebration today. On that note, let's get to the news. COVID deaths continuing to decline, not just here, but really around the world now. Last week, there were fewer than 50,000 confirmed deaths from the coronavirus globally. That was the first time that number has been below 50,000 in almost a year now. Dr. Fauci going on the Sunday shows yesterday saying that people should, quote, go out there and enjoy Halloween as well as the other holidays that are coming up. So he's kind of changing his more cautious tone from uh, what he said a week ago. He also warned that de- against declaring a premature victory against the virus as it's not over, but we all know that now. Uh, also of note, uh, I thought that this was uh, really something. An unvaccinated Republican gubernatorial candidate in Texas who is now recovering from COVID in the hospital said that his experience actually made him, quote, more dedicated to fighting against vaccine mandates. We're talking about Alan West here. He's kind of like a firebrand uh, Tea Party guy trying to get that uh, that governor's job in Texas. He has been advocating for monoclonal antibody treatments, quote, instead of enriching the pockets of big pharma, end quote, which, of course, is just absurd because monoclonal antibodies are made by big pharma companies like Regeneron. And they cost thousands of dollars as opposed to the vaccines, which do the same thing, only they're free and you don't have to actually get sick and get hospitalized first. Anyway, overseas, the U.S. held talks this weekend with representatives of the Taliban. Uh, That was happening in Doha, Qatar, the first face-to-face meeting since the Americans withdrew from Afghanistan eight weeks ago. State Department calling those discussions, quote, candid and professional, while the Taliban went a little further and said that the U.S. actually agreed to provide humanitarian aid to that country so long as it isn't linked to a formal recognition of the Taliban. Now, Afghanistan, if you haven't been paying attention, has been in the process of basically a a full-fledged economic collapse ever since the Taliban took power again. The question here is, can the United States or the West more broadly provide that country with aid that isn't going to be used by the Taliban to do whatever psycho, you know, medieval stuff they like to do, whether that means, you know, stoning women in the public square or executing people for, you know, going out without uh, face covering or something like that. Something else to keep an eye on overseas, uh, two populist leaders in Europe who have been accused of corruption both lost their jobs on the same day this weekend. Uh, Austria's chancellor, Sebastian Kurz, young guy, media savvy guy, sort of seen as kind of like the uh, the future of conservatism in Europe. He resigned on Saturday amid allegations that he paid for positive media coverage. It was sort of a growing controversy there. Hours later, uh, neighboring Czech Republic sent their prime minister packing in parliamentary elections. His name was Andrzej Babiz, uh, he liked to compare himself to Donald Trump. He was elected on promises to root out corruption, kind of another one of these uh, sort of far-right populist leaders in Europe. He lost by a hair to a uh, centrist coalition. Uh, Babis also under investigation for misusing public funds and other forms of corruption. But just taken together, uh, this sort of shows that the rise of the far-right in Europe, which we had been talking about for years, kind of uh, turbocharged um, ever since Trump was elected, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, it's not really happening anymore. At least it is It is slowing, and the centrists are sort of taking power. We already saw that in Germany, and now we're seeing it more uh, in Central Europe. 
Back home, uh, economists here still parsing through the data in Friday's really disappointing jobs report for September, which showed that employers added a meager 194,000 jobs for that month. That wasn't even half of what they were expecting. Uh, the report was the first since those enhanced unemployment benefits expired on Labor Day. Um, and that dismal number sort of suggests that those benefits may have played less of a role in the ongoing labor shortage than many people had thought, myself included. I was sort of under the impression that once those benefits were going to lapse, it was going to force more people back into the labor market. That's not happening. Uh, there were some reasons for optimism buried in the September jobs report. Average earnings were up. Uh, they made significant upward adjustments to the August and July uh, jobs numbers. And there were also just a, a lot of this was pandemic uh, related staffing fluctuations in the education sector that uh, the labor department said distorted the normal seasonal hiring and layoff patterns. Um, but that weak top line number, 194,000 jobs, it does suggest that the persistent labor shortages that we've been talking about, combined with the Delta wave, um, which is, of course, now receding, but was less so when this report was tabulated in September, all of this just continuing to hamper uh, employers' ability to hire. Um, bottom line, a lot of people aren't working. And there are a lot of reasons for that, uh, some of which we probably just don't really quite understand yet. You know, the pandemic, uh, people are going to be studying the effects of the pandemic for decades. Um, and I think it's it's just we don't understand yet, really, a lot of the things that happened in this uh, in this global event, this watershed um event and we're going to be struggling to for a long time. I wish I had sort of better analysis on that, but uh, I think that's kind of the bottom line. A lot of people aren't working. They're not going back to work or if they are, they're going uh, part time or they're taking gig jobs or they're moving. Um, and it's sort of explaining some of the um, some of those labor shortages that seem to be persisting. Meantime, it was another weekend of travel hell uh, in the American skies. If you took a flight this weekend, you probably would have, uh, hopefully not at least, would have seen some of this. Southwest Airlines canceled more than 1,800 flights between Saturday and Sunday. That's basically 30% of their entire schedule. Uh, that airline blamed air traffic control issues, bad weather, and staffing shortages, like we just talked about. Southwest Pilots Union, uh, which is suing that airline over its recent vaccine mandate, they denied that the staffing shortages were the result of any kind of job action or pilot protest. But it is worth noting that no other carrier uh, had an operational meltdown. It was pretty much just Southwest. Um, meantime, in New York, uh, up here, an American Eagle flight made an emergency landing at LaGuardia after a passenger was acting erratically on board. Uh, other passengers on that flight said it looked like this guy had some kind of bomb or at least was pretending like he had a bomb. That man was arrested and pinned on the tarmac. It was a huge scene at LaGuardia this weekend. Uh, that plane being evacuated, but the man was later released without charges. Uh, what a sports weekend. An amazing set of college football games this weekend. Arkansas lost to Ole Miss. Michigan beat Nebraska. Texas A&M beat number one Alabama. That was really the game of the weekend. But meanwhile, in the NFL, it was uh, a rough couple days at the office for the kickers. First up on Sunday, Jets kicker uh, Matt Amendola. He missed an extra point uh, attempt against the Falcons. Then the P Patriots Texans game featured three consecutive missed extra points. The Jags and the Saints also missed extra point attempts in their games. And then the Packers Bengals game, which had no fewer than five missed field goal attempts before Mason Crosby of the Packers sent a 46 yard field goal uh, kick soaring through the uprights in overtime to give Green Bay the win there. You know, NFL kickers, we joke, hey, they sort of have like the easiest and the hardest hardest job in the league, right? They only have to do one thing. Um, and a lot of times that thing is not that hard, but no one really cares when they do it well, but they just get absolutely hammered when they don't. At the box office, No Time to Die did not have the blowout opening weekend uh, at the domestic box office that a lot of analysts were hoping for and expecting. The James Bond film debuted to $56 million. Obviously, that's pretty good, but not anywhere near the estimates of 60 to $70 million. And that soft open also dashing the speculation that it, this would be the first movie to break the uh, $100 million mark in the COVID area. Not anywhere close to that. What does this show? I think it shows that people are still wary of going back to the theater even as COVID starts to decline. And it may not even just be COVID. I think a lot of people have gotten very used to watching movies 
on their TVs and the hassle of going to the theater just isn't worth it for unless it's for those people who really, really enjoy that sort of thing. Um, I happen to be one of those people. I'm going to go see this on Wednesday with my dad, my brother and my sister. Uh, so that will mark my triumphant return to the cinema after 18 months. And I'm very excited for it. I will tell you guys what I thought of this film. Um, and if anyone else saw it this weekend, I'd be curious what you thought. Although no spoilers, please, because I'm trying not to read any reviews. Uh, and finally, uh, just before we go on this sort of uh, shortened holiday pod today, my favorite story of the weekend. Two men who were lost at sea for a month and survived on just oranges and coconuts. Well, they say that all things considered, it wasn't actually so bad. Two fishing buddies set out from the Solomon Islands on September 3rd for a quick fishing trip before a storm knocked them off course. They were found barely alive on October 2nd, about 250 miles away off the coast of Papua New Guinea. One of the two castaways said that while he's looking forward to going home, the experience was, quote, kind of a nice break from everything. So I appreciate that. And thank you guys for uh, bearing with us today and listening to the solo pod. Jill's back tomorrow. And that's what you need to know for Monday, October 11th. 